Hello, my name is Claire and no game has made me ball like a little baby more than Journey. Okay, maybe the ending of Final Fantasy X, but that's not important. What is important is how crucial this game has been in launching the indie scene into the hungry clutches of the mainstream gamer. If you clicked on this video, chances are you've either played Journey and had an experience as emotional as the rest of us, or are a fool to have yet played it. Seriously, go play it right now. Go play it. But maybe after watching this video. But what exactly is it about this game that touches you in places that you never knew could be touched? That sounded way more appropriate in my head. <laughs> Is it the gorgeous music? Yes. The subtle environmental cues and longing for exploration? Yes. The use of visual aesthetics in promoting player agency and fully immersing you within a 3D rendered virtual world? Wait, what? Well, sit tight, because have I got some cool things to explain to you. It's no new fact that Journey is an exceptional game developed by that game company. Oh, I see what they did there. This 2012 indie gem was quickly recognized for its innovative and powerful storytelling, sweeping up awards left, right, and center. Including a total of six BAFTA wins and nominations and being the first ever video game to be nominated for a Grammy. So a pretty big deal. The simplicity of its premise is one of the keys to its success. You play as a robed humanoid cat whose ambiguous task is to traverse a range of landscapes to reach the summit. Aside from the occasional mural that reveals some wordless backstory, you sort of have to piece together yourself. There's really nothing else but your imagination to tell you what's going on. Along the way, and assuming you have an online connection, you might encounter other anonymous players who may take the journey with you. Or they might just straight out ditch you. It's okay, I'm fine, I'm not mad. It's not like Punk Bro 69 really helped me out that much anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> Essentially, you're on a pilgrimage, and while it's easily completed in a single setting, the impact it leaves on you once you finally reach the end is indescribable. And that's the thing, it's truly indescribable. How does such a small indie game know how to get to you and know just how to make you cry? There's this debate that's been rife in the industry for some time now, I'm sure you've heard of it. It's whether games should be considered as art. I've heard the idea of art being applied to Journey quite a lot, um, and while I'm not gonna go into the pros and cons of this sentiment because frankly we'd be here for three hours. I want to acknowledge that regardless of opinion there are ideas and concepts in this video that will be artistic in nature. So that's my little disclaimer. For now though let's start broad. If I was to ask you what is the goal of a video game what would you say? You could say to entertain, yes. to tell a story or to socialize. There's no wrong answer. But my next question is how does it do that? No matter the genre or platform, there is one crucial thing a successful video game simply can't work without. Immersion. Or, in other words, how connected the player feels to the world presented to them. This is what makes video games really stand out as a form of media. If you don't feel as if you're shaping the events of the story, involved with its change or an active participant in the world of the game, you'll end up feeling disconnected, frustrated. This can explain why glitches can break your immersion, because they briefly rip you away from its fictional reality. Don't get me wrong, they can be equally amazing and hilarious, but there's also that disappointing nudge that reminds you that you're basically interacting with nothing but a cold system of code. <laughs> Moving ourselves away from that depressing and sober notion, I want you to think about how this applies to your favorite games. If the world of Skyrim didn't feel like it was living and breathing, if the world of Bioshock was janky and unresponsive, would you feel as connected to the stories and places they depict? It's important to note that immersion is predominantly established by animation. I mean, this may seem pointless to bring up because yeah, video games are basically interactive animations, but when you really start to think about how visual framing, aesthetics, and animation techniques work together to forge an entirely virtual world, things start to get interesting. Now, obviously, animation doesn't just involve cutscenes. They envelop everything from character movement to environmental assets to texture rendering. Everything around you that responds to your engagement within the world they together construct. What we often take for granted as players is how visual can consistency in animation is integral to making the world feel alive, real, and believable. I think this can explain why games that are abstract, minimalistic, experimental, or hyper-realistic feel just as believable as photorealistic titles, while the blockbusters and AAAs are practically tripping over themselves to impress us with their top-notch rendering and high-fidelity graphics. You get gems like Celeste and Cuphead and Undertale that connect with us, make us feel like we're part of their worlds, no matter how unrealistic they might seem. They're freaking just as beautiful as a lens flare. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Yes. I like using the word vitality to explain how a game's environment can make us feel totally immersed. This isn't just regarding the literal biological life or existence of NPCs, but the extent to which we can interact with and mess with them. 
A world full of vitality is a reciprocal world, one that responds to our actions, reacts to our decisions, and becomes generally affected by our presence. The more reactive it is to us, the more alive the world feels, and the more an animated space connects with our movement, our interactions, the more emotional the experience can become. Okay, so that was a big info dump. <laughs> But hopefully by now you get an idea of how important animation and visuals are in establishing player agency within a virtual world. So this is where the notion of art is going to pop up again. And the reason I'm bringing it into the discussion is because of a little artistic principle known as aesthetics. I want to take you to the opening of the game. Camera pans, title drops, our cat is a subject, and the summit? Well, the summit is the goal. Think about this shot like that of a photo, and you might notice it establishes a hint of linear perspective. Linear perspective is a technique in art and photography that follows two orthogonal lines which meet at a vanishing point. Its purpose is generally to establish depth, to build a tension between what is immediate and what is distant, between where we are and where we are heading. Now bring out the academic papers because things are about to get juicy. This article is a gem because it dives into the importance of player agency within interactive worlds. Actually, it's just a spare piece of paper because I don't have a printer. Now I'm going to spare you the nitty gritty of it because it is quite a dense read, but there are some ideas that it brings up that are super fascinating when compared to Journey, especially when we come across a sweet little phrase, the law of the horizon. The important thing to understand about linear perspective is that its goal is to draw our eye to the vanishing point. In the case of exploration-based 3D open world games, that vanishing point is the horizon. In every game that involves player movement, there are subtle ways game developers design virtual environments to ensure we progress from point A to point B. In more linear style games, that movement is narrative progression. In puzzle platformers, it's solving a puzzle that leads us to the next area. And in 3D open worlders, it's the desire to explore that drives us. But in Journey, a game with no combat, no interactive buttons, no map, an ambiguous story and very few, if not simplified, puzzles, the entire agency of the player is resorted to movement. And the one single guide anchoring our navigation within the space is the summit. The animation, the framing of the game's environment, all of it is pointing to the vanishing point, the horizon, the summit. In the famous words of this aforementioned article, our gaze becomes part of the means by which we experience the world as alive and recognize ourselves in it. This quality of perception is what structures our ability to relate to the world. In Journey, our constant perception of the summit is what guides our direction, harbored by a strong sense of linear perspective. It isn't just a gorgeous background feature, it's a narrative frame measuring our sense of progression. The summit is omnipresent, visible from almost every chapter in the game, providing us with constant reference for our movement and framing our journey as leading to an ultimate destination. And if you want to get really complex, consider even more critically how Journey draws your eye both towards the horizon as we anticipate our eventual destination, while continuously returning to our current surroundings as we navigate them. A tension is created between these two spaces, a gap between where we are now and where we are heading. Think about how this tension accentuates a visceral sense of place and location within the world of Journey, and suddenly it becomes more than just eye candy, but a landscape of motion. With all this in mind, it's no wonder why eventually reaching the summit is so damn cathartic, because this tension finally comes to a close. Through its anchoring presence, we're instinctively guided through Journey's beautiful world, traversing it organically without glaring indicators or interruptions. The immersion is constant, natural, making us feel drawn to the environment with a subtlety few games have achieved. It's this that makes it clear that the summit looming ahead is more than just the art designers flexing their landscape rendering muscles. It's a deliberate establishment of scope, direction, and space that makes our journey that much more poignant. Are you still with me? <laughs> I hope so, because my dumb dumb brain struggles to comprehend the incredible subtlety of Journey's dynamic visual framing. But would you believe that we have barely scraped the surface? Yes, there's more. If 3D exploration-based, ambiguously heartfelt titles are your cup of tea, then chances are you've heard of or played Shadow of the Colossus. The law of the horizon technique is rife within this game. Just look at this business. It's a marvel the PS2 system memory could actually handle this level of juice when it was originally released in late 2005. Now, apart from ruthlessly slaughtering docile colossi who literally did nothing to deserve their violent ends, a big chunk of this game is spent traversing the forbidden lands atop your faithful horse, Agro. Wandering the vast landscapes, it doesn't take you long to feel an incredible, overwhelming sense of complete and utter loneliness. I mean, compared with the mountain ranges, the crags, and yeah, the gigantic colossi themselves, you're an ant. The world is so vast in scale, but the expanse is empty, desolate, lonely. 
It shouldn't surprise you that this was a totally deliberate creative decision of the devs, Team Ico. The huge space is purposefully designed to make the player feel small and overwhelmed. This visual spectacle is more than just that. It connects us to the enormity of the space. In other words, there is little detail, but a powerful sense of scale. It goes without saying that a similar feeling is achieved with Journey. The seemingly endless sand dunes, the overwhelming liberty to explore them, even get lost in them. I've literally gotten lost in them. Just adds to this feeling of emotion. It's somber, peaceful, but perturbing as you uncover the tragic and desolate origins of the story, gliding through the vast caverns of the underground, soaring through the endless skies of the final transcendence. Think about how the expansiveness really makes you feel. Solemn, awed, peaceful, frightened, liberated. It takes a pretty special game for its landscape alone to have such an effect on us. Genova Chen, the brilliant game designer of Journey, said that he really wanted to expand on the sense of liberation and freedom that games can bestow on us. I started to realise there is an emotion missing in the modern society, and of course missing in the online console games. It is the feeling of not knowing, a sense of wonder, a sense of awe, at the fact that you don't understand, at the fact that you are so small and you are not empowered, and so our focus for Journey was to make the player feel small and to feel wonder. <laughs> so emotional. Fuck. Like in Shadow of the Colossus, the minimalism and scale of the world in Journey in relation to the player allows for a greater sense of depth and emotional catharsis. Both of these games utilize negative space, otherwise known as the space between places of focus, the uninhabited, empty space, to convey tone and emotion in ways the highly dense and populated worlds of The Witcher 3 and Assassin's Creed don't permit. In photography especially, negative space is used to draw attention to certain focal points. In video games, negative space serves a similar function because it emphasises a sense of scope within a virtual world, especially when its features are minimal. The world itself, in its vastness and emptiness, becomes the agent for emotion. To wrap up, I knew I loved Journey before making this video, and that's, you know, the reason I wanted to make a video on it so badly. But actually doing all this research into it and learning the visual aesthetics, the importance of scope and landscapes has just made me appreciate this game so much more than I already did. When you clicked on this video, I'm willing to bet that a very thorough analysis of aesthetics and visual framing within a virtual world was probably not what you were expecting to hear. <laughs> um, but you know, you're welcome. You learn something new every day. I really think it's just the pinnacle of showing how games can just literally reach into our very souls and connect with us in ways that no other form of media really can. And being interactive spaces, that capacity for connection and depicting emotion just increases by a tenfold. I know the article that I have is uh, is not the article, but I will leave a link to it in the description with the title and the author. Um, I just really love to shout out because it, it honestly provided the inspiration for this video when I studied it in uni, actually, fun fact. Um, it's a very interesting article. I know I said it was a dense read, but I honestly recommend recommend that you check it out and have a look if you have access to it that is. For a bit of fun I'd love for you to comment on the exact moment in the game that made you absolutely well up. I think for me the song is called Atonement when you're ascending that tower right before the snow level. Every time I literally like I just die like I just I just cry so hard it's just <laughs> incredible. Aside from that thank you so much for tuning in again. If you're enjoying this kind of content from me um, I would love to hear your suggestions in the comments or your feedback. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button because that means just the world to me. And aside from that I would also love to hear your ideas for any other videos that you want me to go into. Some ideas and concepts you might want me to cover in a little more depth you know I'm always open to your suggestions. But for now I'm gonna go roll up into a ball and contemplate the meaning of life for a moment so I'll see you next time. <laughs>